So, last night I had difficulty getting to sleep. There had been a film crew recording a TV show on my own road about two doors up from me. And I had helped out by letting them use the front grounds of our home for their vehicles and that kind of thing. I hadn't taken a charge from them, but they had always dropped up lovely food to us every day. Film crews in Ireland are very highly respected, both nationally and internationally, and they're recording something for British television. I won't say too much at this stage. But one must remember that film crews in Ireland are providing countless jobs to people. So if I can help them out in any way with what they're doing, well then that's my own pleasure. So um, they'd been there for three weeks or thereabouts and we'd had a great time and it was great, great crack with them. Um, but it was when they packed up yesterday, they vanished like vampires at dawn and all of a sudden the road has gone really quiet again and I'm missing them, I'm missing them. Um, so last night I decided to watch a movie and um, one of the kind of side effects of being a follower of Thomas Sheridan is that every time he recommends or even makes the slightest mention of a film, that means I have to go and watch it. I never regret it though. It's Thomas who recommended that I watch Borderlands, which I'm going to mention in this video with a plot spoiler. The Mist, which I might plot spoil in this particular recording. And the thing that's definitely going to be plot spoiled is the film I watched last night. The Wicker Man, which is a 1973 film from the UK. Of those three films that I just mentioned, The Mist, Borderlands and The Wicker Man. The Wicker Man is the only one that could conceivably happen in real life because the other two have supernatural features of their story. In The Wicker Man, which is set in its real time of 1973, a police officer goes over to a very remote island, presumably up near the Shetlands or somewhere in Scotland. He has gone because he got a message in the post with a photograph of a child telling him that that child had gone missing. In fact, there was no evidence that the child had gone missing at all. And here's the big plot spoiler. The whole thing was a trap. From the outset, anybody who understands paganism, or rather who has been freed from the yoke of Abrahamic thinking, would have seen that this man, this police sergeant, was putting himself at huge risk. However, he was a devote presumably Noxian Scottish Christian. So he arrives on this island and he says he's a police officer here to inspect the disappearance of a child. The evidence that he's going on is an anonymous letter he got with a photograph. He, from the outset, was not a particularly competent police officer because a photograph and a letter are not enough to suggest that a crime has taken place, particularly if they're sent to you anonymously. Certainly he should have called over and had a chat with the people, but he arrived on this island and was told it was private property and he couldn't land, but he insisted on being let land, which he did. Beyond the letter and the photograph, there was no other evidence. And as the film develops, the people are still making it clear to him that there was no evidence that that child had gone missing. But he kept meddling. And that is one of the primary sacrileges of paganism, to meddle. It's actually probably the number one mortal sin of paganism. And this is why paganism is very fundamentally different in its outlook and its whole paradigm from any Abrahamic religion. It's always interesting to look at these kind of late middle-aged single women you know failed marriages or failed relationships behind them and various different forms of court restriction in relation to their issue who say that they're uh, they're wiccans and they're pagans and here are the golden rules of paganism there are no rules to paganism if there were rules it wouldn't be paganism that's what defines paganism and any different pagan is entitled really to have their own interpretation of it so for example, I would not support animal sacrifice because it's cruel to animals. Um, this notion of burning animals or of slitting their throats in religious ceremonies is something that I would find offensive. But there are pagans who do do that and I would never support that kind of thing. I'd never be involved in any such a ritual or ceremony. The notion of group ceremonies 
and religious services, in my opinion, also was quite contrary to paganism. Paganism is an anarchic mindset. You have to set your own rules and you have to follow your own agenda with paganism. So different pagans have different agendas, of course. But what the sergeant discovers quite quickly when he arrives on this remote private island in Scotland is that there's a large community there. There's quite a well-developed and prosperous village and that they're all pagans. And he becomes shocked at this and he expresses his shock to them in no uncertain terms. That was another mistake that the sergeant made. He'd contempt for the people on the island. He didn't understand them. He wasn't cared to understand them. He didn't care to think about where they were coming from. Throughout the film, almost right up to the end, and this is what it has in common with the borderlands, is that he could always have got out. There's one line in which a woman who owns a sweet shop says to him, you're meddling in sacrifice and you don't know what type of sacrifice it is. When I heard that line, I said to myself, he's going to be killed. And he was, because he was the sacrifice after all. The Lord, who is in charge of the island, I'm not sure if he actually had a seat in the House of Lords or was it just a title that they gave him as the landowner, said to him before he was led up to the wicker man to be burnt alive, you came here of your own free will. And that's the truth. It's the same with the Borderlands. There were warnings left, right and centre for the people who got killed at the end of the Borderlands. There were warnings left, right and centre for the sergeant in the Wicker Man. And he would not or could not see them. So this is... Paganism is an adult mindset. It's an adult paradigm. It's not for kids, paganism. And it's not for people who like the certainties and mindlessness of Abrahamic religion. Abrahamic religion is for people who want a nice a nice ending and a messiah to come around the corner eventually. It's not going to happen. It's not going to be a messiah. There's not going to be a messiah. And pagans know that. So pagans realise that they have to live in the present and they have to deal with what's around them. So... The sergeant came to the island looking for a missing child based on an anonymous letter and a photograph he got. He then spends a night in the pub in the island in which all of the locals in the crowded pub sing a song about fucking the landlord's daughter. It then turns out that the landlord's daughter is indeed a prostitute. She played brilliantly by Britt Eklund. Brilliantly by Britt Eklund. One of her best performances. She was superb. Absolutely superb in it. I'm not suggesting that Britt Eklund is a whore, but I'm suggesting that her whole... The way that she got into the landlord's daughter character was ideal and she even got the Scottish accent right you know there were some superb performances in it another one from Christopher Lee as the landlord and you know even the children performed extremely well they weren't corny kiddie performances they were all very authentic much of the photography in the film left a lot to be desired some of the editing and some of the looping and soundtracking again left a lot to be desired but it was 1973 in a british budget so one must understand the restraints and constraints that making cinema had in those days not just budgetary but technical from a technical point of view it actually was a triumph of film i believe that it is a dark comedy People say that it's a horror film. I don't accept that because horror requires visual visuality of what's happening. There wasn't very much of that at all. Um, I believe that the final scene in which the wicker man went in flames with this man tied up in it and burnt to death, which ended then with a big song routine from all of the people who lived on the island, I found it extremely funny, but in the right way. I wasn't suggesting, I'm not suggesting that I found the film to be bad. I thought it was terribly appropriate, but I think the vibe of the film was closer to being a very, very subtly black comedy rather than being a serious horror film in comparison to The Mist. There was no comedy in The Mist. There was no comedy in The Borderlands, whereas there was a lot of subtle comedy in The Wicker Man. I found it very amusing. Maybe it's just my own dark sense of humour, perhaps, but I loved the way that it was so apparent to me as the viewer that this very gullible, pious, Presbyterian, Noxian sergeant was in the first instance being laughed at, but also then as the the story developed, heading towards his death. 
Had he turned around and said to the people on the island two things. First of all, I don't think there's anything to investigate here. And secondly, whatever about your pagan beliefs, they're not for me. Uh, I think I'd like to leave now. I don't think I have any business here. He just survived. Those people did not set out to murder him, but they weren't going to tolerate him meddling in their lives. They also did send him, it's quite apparent, that the letter and the photograph was sent to him by somebody on the island as a trap to lure him over. But you can only fall into a trap if you are willing to. This leads on now to a relevant political issue in Ireland today. And that's our Taoiseach, Micheál Martin. He has now fallen into a trap. The trap was set for him primarily by Fine Gael and by those globalist banker people who are pulling the shot, pulling the strings from behind the scenes. People give too much power to... People in the, the general public have too much regard for what they call the globalists and the vested interests. Ireland is a sovereign country. It's still a sovereign country within the European Union. It is up to us to elect politicians who will stand up for our best interests. We have chosen not to. That's our problem. That's our fault. However, this year we had a general election and we had the most hung doyle that we've ever had in the history of the state since 1922. Micheál Martin should have read the warnings but he did not and he paid a very high price for something else Leo Varadkar became Taoiseach in 2017 Micheál Martin should immediately have withdrawn from the supply and confidence arrangement he had done with Leo Varadkar's predecessor Enda Kenny and he should have pushed immediately for a general election and there is a number of reasons for this but one of the primary reasons is that Leo Varadkar is a psychopath. Thomas will tell you this. I will agree. Do not deal with psychopaths. Walk away if you have any option to do so. Micheál Martin had the option to walk away. He could have gone for a general election and brought down Varadkar's government. Instead, he became Varadkar's enabler. Now, today and yesterday with the lockdown, poor old naive gentle Michal is paying the price and he is going to pay a bitter price indeed so anyway we had a general election on the 8th of February this year and RTE of course being RTE um, obfuscated on the night of the election by banging on incessantly about a member of staff who had died the election is the news, not a member of staff who's died. I think it's highly unprofessional for a television station to lament on air during their news about a colleague who's died. Do it on another occasion, absolutely, but the news is the news. The death of a colleague in a television station is not actually newsworthy. As much as one might sympathise with the bereaved family left behind, it actually does not comprise relevant public interest news that a member of staff in a television station died. But on the night of the general election, RTG spent the first 20 minutes of each of their evening news bulletins, that is 6 o'clock and that is 1800 hours and 2100 hours, talking about a member of staff who died. I said to myself, this is deliberate, this is obfuscation. That's all. The person to blame for that is John Williams, who's the head of news and current affairs in RTE. John Williams is a disgrace to the name of journalism. The name journalism and the word journalism and the name John Williams should not sit together in any praiseworthy sentence. John Williams is probably not intelligent or insightful enough to even understand the obviousness of the bias that he applied since he became head of news and current affairs in RTE. Interestingly, that happened to him in 2016 and Varadkar became Taoiseach in 2017. One of the things that so many of us ob observed from the moment Varadkar became Taoiseach was the extent to which RTE just gave him a total free pass, as they still do. That's John Williams. John Williams is the head of news and current affairs. So to that extent, he can abuse his position as he has by allowing his own prejudices to govern what gets broadcast. I think John Williams has an awful lot to answer for. But the reality is 
that this country is governed by its elected politicians. You can say what you like about vested interests or the European Union or the rest of it. This country is governed first and foremost by its elected politicians. Micheál Martin <coughs> enabled Varadkar for three years. He, you know, in his own wishy-washy way, gave blustery oppositions to Varadkar during the three years of Varadkar's tenure as Taoiseach. But he did not oppose him. He did not oppose him and he did not bring down Varadkar's government. So now Micheál Martin, as of yesterday, um, Tuesday the 20th of October 2020, Micheál Martin has now introduced an exceptionally draconian lockdown across the Republic of Ireland. This reminds me of the police sergeant on the island in Scotland. And by the way, it was in 1973. So in 1973, it seems from the film that there was no electricity on the island, that they used oil lamps, that they used log fire heating, that kind of thing. So when he was trapped on the island, he was in a sticky position. And he didn't have any insight into that. And almost up to the very, very end, he was saying, I am a police officer, I am a sergeant, and there will be a team here to resist you. And all the pagans on the island were going, yeah, all right, yeah, okay. You know what you're going to do. What you're going to do? You're going to ring them? There's no phone. There's no mobiles. There's no satellites even. So he was, he did not have any, that's, uh, watching the film, what became very clear to me within the first 15 to 20 minutes was that this man was in a trapped position. He was in a much more vulnerable position than he even, well, he was, than he was aware of. He was on this remote island in 1973. How is he going to get out? Smoke signals? So, Micheál Martin is in something similar. He is still trying to invoke his authority as Taoiseach. And what Varadkar and all of these other people preyed upon was primarily Varadkar preyed upon it. Was Micheál Martin's absolute weakness, which is his desire to be Taoiseach. He did not wish to have the ignominy of being the only leader of Fianna Fáil his, in Fianna Fáil history not to become Taoiseach. And my goodness, they preyed upon that. Because I remember when the Doyle reconvened after the general election, I wondered what Martin would say. I wondered what Martin would say. And if Martin had gone in and said, Ladies and gentlemen, members Count Corley, we had a mandate to win an election here and we blew it. We had one job to do and we blew it. Not the voters, we. We blew it. So I'm digging my heels in till we get another election. If that requires me to resign as leader of Fianna Fáil, off I go. If that requires me to resign as a TD, off I go. You see, Trump has that, that resolve inside him. Trump, I don't think, would care if he lost the coming election, which he's going to win. Well, I mean, he's not up against tough opposition there, is he? I mean, you know, he beat Clinton, for Christ's sake, and she at least had the kind of woke status, uh, virtue signalling status of being first woman candidate for president. What's he up against now? But Trump could walk away from this all. So within his own head is beholden to nobody. Whereas Micheál Martin in his own head is beholden to the notion of being, of not being the first Fianna Fáil leader not to be Taoiseach. He was not able to let go of that. In the same way that the sergeant was not able to let go of his sense of authority in the island. Oh, look at me, I'm the sergeant. And all the pagans are saying, yeah, well, okay. <laughs> That's cool, sergeant. You know, we gave you your warning. You were told to leave. You were told there was nothing suspicious here. You took the bait. They set a trap for him and he took it. He took it and took it. And Micheál Martin ha had a trap set for him and he took it and took it. Because it's getting a lot bleaker here in Ireland. And I have great empathy and pity for people who are running small businesses. What they should have done was closed everything down in March. Those of us who have been on the outside for many years are able to see that the government is mendacious and has been for a long time. It wasn't always like this. I think the shift happened around 2007, really, in Ireland. Or 2008. But certainly from the 2008-2009 point onwards, when they bailed out the bankers, that for me was the sign that our government was our enemy. I've not seen anything to suggest otherwise since. 
And when you're dealing with that kind of government, you must accept that they lie. When do they lie? All the time. So those of us who've been up against the state in the High Court of that know that the government lies. They lie and lie and lie. And then when they're given evidence of their lying, they lie that, about the evidence. They lie and lie and lie and lie. The women who are victims of cervical cancer, uh, the cervical cancer scandal will tell you that if they're still alive. That scumbag Tony Holohan, who all those ones in RTE can't take their tongue out of his arse. Scumbag Holohan. He lies. He lied in his capacity dealing with the cervical cancer scandal. So did Harris, who got an award from some higher education institution, I don't know. You know, they lie. They lie, they lie, they lie. So... When we had our first lockdown in Ireland in March of this year, that was the time for all the private businesses to say, right, that's it, we're closing down, goodbye. Call their bluff, lay off all the staff, sack them all, close, be done with it. No, 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 they said, oh, we'll just hang in there, sure. Uh, what is it, two weeks or three weeks to flatten the curve? Well, guys, how did that turn out for you? How did that turn out for you? And the moral of the story is to never give a sucker an even break. Break. 